。瑞达利欧二十六岁时，在自己的两居室公寓里创办了桥水。美国对冲基金平均存活四年，而桥水已经屹立四十五年之久。二零一八年，达利欧基于自己的生活和工作撰写的《原则》一书，在中国大陆上市当年即畅销百万册。他相信，历史上绝大多数事情都是反复发生的，人们可以通过研究事物的规律，制定出妥善应对的原则。施一公二零零八年辞去普林斯顿大学的终身教授职位，回国后受聘为清华大学终身教授。在原则出版的二零一八年，施一公筹建了国内高等教育史上第一所由社会力量举办的大学——西湖大学，并担任校长。周期如何影响我们的生活？创新为何如此重要？什么是好的教育？本期凤凰网财经封面，达里欧对话施一公。Uh, I'm so excited.、Uh, Professor Shi and I、um, have a remarkable amount in common, even though we come from different worlds. You know,、um, the focus of Professor Shi is a lot on science and、um, development and innovation in that regard, and my background is as a global macro investor.、Uh, but we shared. Uh, interesting developments in our lives that、um, have made our lives intertwined. My background as a global macro investor for 50 years or a little bit more than that has been to go globally, all through most countries in the world, and understand their economics, and then bet on the directions of those economies. And I learned through that process that many things that surprised me were things that never happened in my lifetime before, but happened many times in history. Over the last number of years, three big forces that hadn't happened in my lifetime to the degree that they are now happening、uh, developed. Uh, those three forces were first the、uh, creation of a lot of debt and a lot of printing of money to pay for that debt.、Uh, we saw that、uh, first in 2008, and now we're seeing it in much greater degrees. In the past, when central banks would want to be stimulative. They would put in、um, lower interest rates, but every lower interest rate to stimulate the economy, to give people money and credit, to give them buying power, they would always do these things. So they lowered interest rates until interest rates hit zero, and then they printed a lot of money to create a lot of debt, and that debt created buying power. But of course, it created obligations. And it created a lot of um, um, financial assets. And in 2020, that happened to a greater degree than has ever happened in our lifetimes. The second factor, related to the first factor, is large wealth gaps and large political gaps that took place, particularly in the United States and Europe. I lived. In a, in a sense, the American dream, and other in other countries, they lived in other dreams where people with ideas could come along and get financial resources to pursue those ideas and to be creative, and that raises living standards over a period of time, and the development of markets, capital markets,、um, that allow people with capital who save. To give it to others who put it to good use to be productive has raised living standards over periods of time, but it、um, distributes wealth unevenly, because those who make a lot of money make a lot of money, and those who don't less, and the circumstances create unequal opportunities. For example, children of those who have a lot more money have better opportunities than those. Who don't? The, the children of those who don't have parents have a lot of money, and as a result, the cycle, the big cycle, is that、um, greater and greater debts 
and greater and greater uh, wealth gaps emerge. Third great force throughout history is the rise of a great power to challenge the existing great power and the existing world order. It's natural. So in studying history, I saw this happen over and over again uh, in that cycle. And so for, we see it as China has uh, grown and improved and strengthened and become healthier in many ways. As I mentioned, I've come to China since 1984, and I've had the pleasure of participating in and seeing the development since I came in 1984, per capita income has increased by 26 times. The life expectancy has increased by 10 years. The poverty rate has gone from 88% to less than 1%. It's remarkable. China now is a country which has um, uh, uh, the strengths that's uh, like the United States, comparable in many ways, and is also growing at a rate which um, implies that it will be larger. China um, has a population that's more than four times the size of the United States population. So if per capita income is half the United States, then it will be twice as large. So I studied these cycles in history. I'd like to just show you a chart that shows the empires going back the, since 1500. The red line all the way on the lot left is China. And so you can see that red line, if you follow it through, you could see it was the most, the richest and most powerful country right around 1500, at, right after that. And then it, uh, uh, its relative stature declined. And then you could see around 1840, the decline in what was called the Hundred Years of Humiliation. And then you could see the very strong rise since then to rise up to approximately where the United States is. It's, I think it's very important to see where we are in that cycle right now. Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn that over um, and just show you that evolution of a typical cycle. The archetypical big cycle. Broadly speaking, we could look at these rises and declines as happening in three phases from one new order to the next new order. There is the phase of the rise, then the phase of the top, and then the phase of the decline. The rise. The rise is the prosperous period of building that comes after a new order, which typically follows a war. It is when the country is fundamentally strong because there are relatively low levels of indebtedness, relatively small wealth values, and political gaps between people. People working effectively together to produce prosperity, good education and infrastructure, strong and capable leadership, and a peaceful world order that is guided by one or more dominant world powers, which leads to the top. This period is characterized by excesses in the form of high levels of indebtedness, large wealth values and political gaps, declining education and infrastructure, conflicts between different classes of people within the countries, and struggling between countries as overextended empires are challenged by emerging rivals, which leads to the decline. This is the painful period of fighting and restructuring that leads to conflicts and changes in the establishment of new internal and external orders. It sets the stage for the next order and a new period of prosperous building. When all of these forces line up, indebtedness, civil war and revolution at home, war abroad, and the loss of faith in the currency, a change in the world order is typically at hand. When those holding the reserve currency and debt of the declining empire lose faith and sell them, that marks the end of the big cycle. And so seeing that cycle and seeing where we are is important. 
And when those three things come together, when there's a rise of a great power challenging the existing great power, naturally there's a competition, a conflict. And, and inside, when there are large wealth gaps and uh, pro- financial problems, there is a conflict. Uh, but the greatest force um, is the force, there were two other forces that came and became apparent. One was the acts of nature. It was very interesting to me to see that acts of nature in the form of pandemics, droughts, and floods had a bigger impact on the um, uh, uh, c- circumstances, life expectancy, and um, other influences than uh, anything else. But all of those combined are um, less important than the fifth influence, and that is, over time, the inventiveness of man. Um, This chart um, goes back uh, to 1500, and it shows a per capita income on the left, and it also shows life expectancy on the right. And what you can see is that um, uh, that very strong upward movement because of man's inventiveness and adaptability has uh, created this uh, very big rise in living standards over that period of time, and that the wiggles that we're talking about, such as wars and such, um, uh, in that context, appear very small in comparison. And so in seeing this, um, I step back and I think we live in a world right now where there is more resources and more abilities uh, to have good life and to be inventive. And the issue is really one of conflict. And if we could work well together, we have an opportunity to make things better than ever. Having listened to the lecture by Mr. Dario, I've learned a lot. Today, I'm only going to share one little spot of what Mr. Dario talked about. That is innovation at present time and our future. More recently, I have had the very good fortune of collaborating with a group of diverse thinkers who share common values to not just develop a new university here in China, but a new kind of tertiary educational institution. This magical, innovative place is Westlake University. In fact, Westlake University itself is an innovation with new principles of fostering innovation as its central focus. It is supported by the public at large through the non-profit Westlake Education Foundation. In the course of innovation, we actually face a quagmire. On one hand, we must learn before we can innovate. Without certain knowledge, we have no idea about where and how to innovate. On the other hand, learning may set a boundary on our thoughts. Imagine us as passengers on a fast-moving car, or a fast-moving train. For that regard, the faster the train, the sooner one can reach a defined destiny, but the less likely one can get off to explore the wild surroundings. In contrast, it's it is much easier to explore the unknown on foot, although a lone explorer runs a high risk of encountering dangers in the wild. Pursuing innovation often means being in a rare minority. By choosing to innovate, you have broken away from the mainstream and embarked on a lonely journey. Being a rare minority, you might be misunderstood discouraged, ridiculed by your peers, or even suppressed by the public at large. Unfortunately, this happens in academic research all too often. Through great perseverance over what at times may seem to others like decades of fruitless, misguided efforts, some scientists eventually innovate, producing what appears to be overnight miracles. As an example, we have as an example we have to look no further than the mRNA-based COVID vaccines. But really, 
How do we encourage innovations then? Innovation often grows out of a healthy culture, a culture that encourages differences and tolerates repeated failures in good faith. Innov innovation frequently requires critical thinking. After heated debate, the Human Genome Sequencing Project was launched more than 30 years ago and costed more than two billion U.S. dollars to complete. But it triggers a revolution in biotechnology and biomedicine that is still up unfolding. Collaboration promotes innovation. Individuals with different expertise from different research areas, institutions, and nations may join forces to make magic happen. Furthermore, diversity promotes innovation. Individuals of different backgrounds, regions, cultures, and ethnicities each bring unique strengths to facilitate innovation. The value of collaboration and diversity are best illustrated by detection of the gravitational wave in September 2015. We on Earth recorded the passage of gravitational waves that originated from collision of two black holes about 1.3 billion years ago. Despite our transient nature, we seek to understand the surroundings near and far. With brief curiosity and inspirational spirit, we are determined to explore the universe. We have set foot on the moon, landed spacecrafts on the Mars, and detected black holes and stars billions of light years away. For the great challenges that humankind faces, our salvation is in our ability to innovate. Our future is in our hands. Treasure life, seek truth, innovate with a conscience. Now, why is that important? Well, it's the, it's the betterment of mankind, and it is the thrill of the newness. When I uh, came to China in 1984, um, I saw the difference in living standards. But uh, uh, to give you an idea, I would bring $10 calculators and give them to very high-ranking officials, and they thought they were miracle devices. And then there were hutongs, and there, and there, and there was no innovation. There was no, the, the work environment was different. You were assigned your jobs and it was narrow. And so what you've seen, experienced, all of you, is the rise in uh, living standards and the rise in the intellectual stimulation that comes from being able to be a participant in those kinds of environments. So why is it important? Because it raises your living standards but it also gives you an intellectual stimulation that makes for a richer life. I share the view expressed by Mr. Dario in every sense. Innovation is really the basic element of our society to move forward. If you think about it, everything we enjoy today comes from innovation. We both have a similar, if you will, um, similar background in the sense we each come from remote areas in our respective nations. Another commonality between the two of us is our shared enthusiasm uh, in continued development in China, I think. And uh, despite um, some of the um, challenges ahead for China, I think China in a bigger cycle, as Mr. Dario phrased it, is I think on the rise, presumably have not reached the top yet. So in this grand cycle, I think you know, China will perform pretty well. You know, in one sentence, uh, everything we do in our society, we must have innovation because that's our human nature. We have to innovate to make ourselves better. Otherwise, we dwell on the past. In studying the cycles, over the last 500 years, um, and then also I started with the Tang dynasties, um, so around the year 600, and to find the rise and declines of uh, dynasties as well as uh, empires. 
uh, you see the same patterns. And then there are two different types of education. There's the education of acquiring knowledge, which is skill, but there is also the education in original thinking. And so you see, a well-educated person can be a type of person that is, has a lot of facts and abilities to calculate in their mind, or another type of education is the ability to use their minds in original ways. And the difference between those is very important in terms of uh, being able to create innovation, right? Because learning what was acquired in the past is not going to get you the, an innovation in the future, even though it's a foundation for that. And the one thing that was common of all the dynasties, you could look at it from uh, the Tang, the Sung dynasties, and, and so on, is that um, the drawing on the greatest population so that you do not know who is going to be um, in that society, the ones that will be the innovators. And so for all societies, it was to make it open to the greatest number of people and to create a meritocracy so that those people could be identified and rise and be supportive. So uh, a lot of um, you know, common thoughts uh, shared between us. Uh, I'd like to add a little bit uh, in, in particular with respect to China's own circumstances. Education should be diverse. We should have a diversity, a range of different educational formats. What, do I, what I'm talking about? I'm talking about education reform. Uh, I think that is, this is particularly important for a very large nations such as China. Um, for China to move forward, to, for China to be able to innovate, um, you know, and to, uh, and in science and technology, to be able to, um, you know, cultivate talented students, next generation, uh, China must uh, relentlessly continue education reform. I think that's the only way to go. Um, think about this. In a nation of 1.4 billion people, if you only have a, a set of rigid forms, uh, several rigid forms of education, uh, one or two several you know, rigid forms of examination, and that will place severe limits on the type of students you might be able to train, educate, and give chances to. So uh, for me, to me and to, uh, to people of my generation, to scientists of my likes, um, we really think a large nation such as China uh, should, be, you know, should be always open to educational reform. And this is part of the reason why uh, a group of us came together to build a brand new university. In many universities in China, uh, we are training students with great skills. Um, you know, we have in-depth training in math, physics, chemistry, biology, you know, literature, everything. And students are well-versed with contemporary knowledge. And they are skilled to go on to pursue other professions in our, in our society. But what is not quite adequate as I see it is the level of social responsibility. And what I mean is, um, when we go out in the world to fight for our own well-being, to fight, you know, to have our own personal, you know, uplifting stories in the making, um, our goal is in line with the overall betterment, should be in line with the overall betterment of our society. What I mean is, Whatever we do in our society should not be contrary to the fundamental benefits or the in fundamental interest of the society. I think that there's a natural evolution that I've experienced. Um, and like Professor Xi, um, 
didn't have much, and then you learn and you work and you innovate. Um, and I think there are three stages in one's life. The first phase is that you're dependent on others and you're learning. In the second phase, you go out and you work and others become dependent on you and you're trying to be successful. And then as you pass through that phase, you come to a phase in your life, which is the phase I'm in, in which I no longer um, have, I, I want the most important thing I want to do is pass along to the next generation what I have that is valuable. And then I go beyond that. And so that's the phase. And I think that if one thinks about what does one want, what does one need, and one feels connected with the society, it is very natural to take the, what one has, the resources one has, and to uh, make those available to those people who are in that other phase to help to enable them. And so it's that process that becomes very natural. For example, philanthropy. And by the way, I learned about philanthropy through my son, uh, who, when he was 11, went to an all Chinese school in China and so on, and time passed. And he realized um, that he spent a lot of time there. And he realized that there were special needs orphans who would not be receiving surgeries and so on. And he got involved. And one can realize that accumulating more for oneself is not, so, it's almost decadent. So I think that there's a natural evolution to being able to first take care of oneself and then to go beyond that where one doesn't need great amounts more for oneself and one has a desire to um, help the society as a whole and to raise that up in terms of living standards. It's all a matter of attitude. Um, if you view life as an adventure that you're on and the journey, and you accept the fact that it will have ups and downs, and that all those ups and downs are just a reflection of how reality works. And if you're curious about how reality works and how to interact with it, to try to have the best life possible, then life is an adventure. And if you have that adventure, that sense of adventure, and you have that sense of curiosity, then all through those ups and downs, you will approach them better and you will find life to be much more rewarding than if you don't have that attitude. Let me add maybe my two cents. We have a changing world a world is developing even faster and faster, you know, by year. And knowledge is accumulating at a very, you know, fast rate that may create some level of anxiety. Actually, we should not. So I've, all, I've always been telling myself to stay calm, to be good at what I'm doing. I always believe as long as I try hard enough on my own profession, in my own research area, and spending time to read the immediate relevant materials, and now to be panicking over fast changing environment, fast accumulating knowledge, and that should work out pretty well. You don't have to spend that much time learning other things or even new things. Only learn those things when you see an immediate change in the making. When you see the thing that you are working on, that you are dealing with, require a new thinking, new method, new equipment, etc. So basically, I think we should keep maintain our composure. As long as we try hard on what we are good at, um, and then maintain our vigilance, I think things will be fine.